to uh, the latest ISGAP seminar on the intersectionality of anti-Semitism. My name is Max Warder. I'm a PhD candidate at Princeton University, and I'm very, very uh, excited to uh, welcome uh, Professor David Patterson here uh, this morning to give a talk uh, about the intersectionality of anti-Semitism. So this talk is part of a series um, called the Inter Intersectionality of Antisemitism. Uh, given the global pervasiveness of antisemitism, its online presence and related inroads into the mainstream, there, been, there may be no greater challenge for scholars of antisemitism than to reconsider our assumptions about who antisemites are, where and how they mobilise. This 12-part series of seminars, six in the fall and six in the spring, interrogates the identities antisemites presumably possess, the ideological positions they prefer and the places they inhabit. With an eye toward antisemitism's ideological fluidity, as well as its contradictions and corresponding convergences, we are interested in original, interesting and emerging areas of antisemitism research. To this end, we invite researchers to present work on a range of topics that include, but are not exclusive to, antisemitism's convergence with misogyny, racism and heterosexism. We're also interested in the growing convergence between the social movements and the corporations news outlets whose legitimacy and bottom line are informed by our position to or connection with antisemitism. So in this is the name of this is the seminar series. So very, very excited to welcome you today, Professor David Patterson, who holds the Hilo A. Feinberg Distinguished Chair in Holocaust Studies at the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies, University of Texas at Dallas. He is a commissioner on the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission and a member of the executive board of the annual scholars conference on the Holocaust and the churches. He has lectured at universities on six continents and throughout the United States. David has published 40 books and more than 240 articles, essays and book chapters on antisemitism, the Holocaust and Jewish studies. He has won the National Jewish Book Award, the Coret Jewish Book Award and the Holocaust Scholars Conference and Eternal Flame Award. His most recent books are Judaism, Antisemitism, Holocaust, Making the Connections, Shoah and Torah, Portraits, Elie Wiesel's Hasidic Legacy, The Holocaust and the Non-Representable, and Antisemitism and its Metaphysical orange, uh, Origins. David is also an ISGAP Senior Research Fellow. So with that, I'm very delighted to welcome Press Patterson to speak to us today about antisemitism, intersectionality and the Academy. Um, just before we begin, any questions, please pop them in the chat, and then after Professor Patterson talks, we'll have time to uh, ask him more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Thanks so much. Um, okay. Yes, intersectionality. And in one of the um, perhaps most disturbing aspects of uh, today's anti-Semitism, and it's not just today's, by the way, is, is the, the Academy's acceptance of anti-Semitism. And, and that's where we really see the intersectionality uh, in its most fundamental form. Now, what is this, what is intersectionality anyway, phenomenon? The, according to uh, psychiatrist, Kevin Levin, he's from uh, Harvard Medical School. Um, intersectionality lies in the, 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 a, kind, the, a certain deception of equation, you know, saying the same as. <laughs> as he says, intersectionality is the shared victimhood of groups victimized by white male racism and its history of imperialism, colonialism, exploitation, and slavery. Among the prominent anti-Semitic intersectionality allies in academia are ethnic activists, LGBTQ activists, feminists, and others on the political far left. Uh, extending beyond academia is a certain intersectionality with white supremacists, neo-Nazis, jihadists, and others whose Jew hatred is legitimized ultimately by the guardians of higher learning. And, uh, this is certainly with regard to anti-Zionism. Anti-Zionism is the, the, the nexus of intersection in all of these intersectionalities. Anti-Zionism uh, spills over to anti-Semitism. How? The, the hatred of the, anti, of the, of the Zionist ent entity is a hatred of a, of a kind of abstraction. Hatred of the Zionist entity 
comes much more easily, is much easier than hatred of the Jewish human being, of the flesh and blood human being. So hatred of the Zionist entity is ultimately the hatred of a certain teaching that comes forth from Zion that is undermining to various agendas on the far left, far right, and, and in other sectors. There's a scene in the, in the film, The Book Thief, perhaps some of you have seen it, when the, the little girl, Liesl, as, uh, during uh, the Third Reich, comes home uh, to her family where they're hiding a Jew. She goes down into the basement and asks the Jew, Max, why do they hate the Jews? <laughs> and he tells them, because we remind them of their humanity. Um, the they, in this case, uh, are the anti-Zionists. Why do they hate the Jews? Because we remind them of their humanity, because the Jews represent a view of humanity that is contrary to the, the, the fundamental understanding of what makes a human being, what constitutes the dearness of a human being. As Emmanuel Levinas says, anti-Semitism is hatred of the other human being as attested to in the Jewish teaching and tradition. The human being as a child of God, human being created in the image and likeness of God, the human being uh, who, who stems from a single human, uh, which suggests that there is no such thing as race, that race itself is a, uh, a, a false category. Um, as the rabbis say, we all come from one, from Adam and not two, so that none of us can say to the other, my side of the family is better than your side of the family. There is no separation of, uh, that can be determined by race. Race, again, is a, an artificial construct, an abstraction from a Jewish standpoint, uh, from the standpoint of the teaching that goes forth from Zion. Now, one of the most uh, widespread uh, intellectual fashions and fads is critical race theory. Um, and if you, if you go to a volume, I can recommend a volume, uh, a collection of essays called Critical Race Theory, the key writings that form the movement. The key writings that form the movement is edited by Kimberly Crenshaw, Neil Kotanda, Gary Peller, and Kendall Thomas. Uh, if you go, if you examine these these key writings, you see that race functions for critical race theory as class does for Marxism. There's a heavy Marxist influence. Uh, race, in other words, is tied to privilege. Uh, race is a first principle in this thinking. In other words, it's the most fundamental determinant, uh, determination of the value of the human being. Prior to social or political constructs, the social and the political stems from race, is the idea. Uh, race here is a legal and political category of power. Um, many of the early critical race theorists, at least I say early, from the 70s and, and 1980s, are jurists or from law schools. <clears throat> and still, many are from law schools. Um, according to this view, truth is determined by an ego-centered narrative. And if you remember Descartes, I think, therefore I am. You know, my being is lies in my thinking ego. Uh, Immanuel Kant, who understood... Uh, freedom to lie in the autonomy of the thinking ego. Um, the thinking ego is the, is the determinant of reality, okay, and value, not the commanding voice of God, okay? It's I think, therefore I am, not God creates me, I therefore I am, or God commands, therefore I am. Um, the, the various human races, according to this thinking, are separated by a, a gap that can never be bridged. There can be no connection. And white privilege is the source of all evil. This is, this is, this is what ties all forms of evil together. And all Jews are white because Jews are privileged. Okay. White here is not the color. White is the privilege. Um, in, this, in this volume, Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the editors, 
uh, maintains that racial political power determines human value. There's nothing like that, the holiness of a human being created in the divine image. This teaching that comes from Judaism, that goes forth from Zion, so to speak, is undermines the premise that racial political power determines human value. And this premise is central to critical race theory. Uh, another one of the editors, Gary Peller, <clears throat> um, promoting the idea that races are essentially separate. Uh, each race has its own essence and essence can't mix. You know, uh, a dog can't become a cat. <clears throat> so he, he, he embraces Stokely Carmichael's <clears throat> promotion of critical race separatism or racial separatism as which is, he claims it's central to critical race theory. Uh, Stokely Carmichael, you recall, was uh, from the uh, civil rights movement in the 1960s. Uh, he became affiliated with the uh, the Black Panthers, and uh, you know, and, and black separatism. And Carmichael was known to have said that you know he had no love for white people. White people are essentially evil; they're irredeemable. Uh, but he, he once said that to, to the greatest of, of white people, to his mind, was Adolf Hitler, uh, because Adolf Hitler had the solution to the Jewish problem. Uh, another figure, Ibram X. Kendi, who's uh, well-known, very popular, not only on the academic scene, but on the cultural scene. Uh, Kendi is at Boston University at the moment, and his book, uh, he, uh, on how to be an anti-racist, he says the most threatening racist movement is not the alt-right's unlikely drive for a white ethnostate. Okay, it's not the alt-right alt white supremacists that are the biggest threat, but the regular Americans drive for a race-neutral state. Okay, um, the, the greatest threat lies in the rejection of race as a defining essentialist category. So the real racist, according to Kendi, is the one who denies the essentialism of race as a first principle okay, that determines everything else. Uh, here, uh, and, and most, fundam most fundamentally, uh, most anciently, from from most the most ancient times, the ones who deny that in their thinking and their teaching is the Jews, the Jews whose teaching comes forth comes forth from Zion. Uh, here, you you can see why uh, the critical race theorist has to be anti-Zionist. The anti because the Zionist is not is not just someone who was seeking a homeland and a haven for the Jews but for Judaism. Um, so you go this, you have at the same time as critical race theory is, is developing, the, the theorists, before it was called critical race theory, you have this move to e equate, to intersect Zionism and racism. Uh, this you have, here you have the same as of intersection. And this comes from, came from the Soviets. This is a push by the Soviets in the early 70s until they got the resolution 3379 in 1975, declaring that Zionism is racism. And as Robert Wistrich points out, one of the great scholars of anti-Semitism, it's at this point that the Soviet campaign against the Jews that unfolded throughout the 70s and, and into the 80s, into especially 1982, eroded the already flimsy distinctions between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Now, let's go to the academy. Uh, how does this play out in the academy, this intersection of anti-Zionism and racism and drawing anti-Zionism into various academic agendas? These are a few of the professional academic associations that have issued statements condemning Israel as and condemning Zion, Zionism. Uh, 
supporting BDS, the, uh, the Boycott Divest Sanction Movement, at the African Literature Association, right? Uh, American Studies Association, uh, Clinical Ethnic Studies, Native American and Indigenous Studies, uh, Modern Language Association. These, these are just a few. And you might recall just this last summer, when uh, when Israel you know was engaging Hamas and, and Gaza once again early in the summer, uh, more than 130 gender studies programs issued a statement condemning Israel and and, and coming down saying we we are we are supporting Hamas. I think they use the word Palestinians, but it is obviously Hamas in this conflict. And indeed, part of their statement uh, was that the, the Palestinian cause is the feminist cause, is the same as. So you see this other you know, example of an, uh, another form of, in, of intersection. Now, where does this the same as lead? Um, when, when Israelis defend themselves, Jews, Jewish students on campuses get attacked. Uh, they're the same as the Zionist entity. So in, in July 2015, January 2015, Naftali Bennett issued a report. This is following the uh, another uh, conflict between the Israelis and Hamas in the, the previous summer, 2014. He notes a 400% increase in a study done uh, in the number of anti-Semitic incidents on American campuses, 400%, not only from other students, but also from professors. Uh, students are the same as, on the campus, the same as Israelis trying to defend themselves. Um, sorry. National Dem Demographic Survey of Jewish College Students. This is from the uh, Brandeis Center and Trinity College, Barry Cosman and Ariella Kaiser did this survey, found that more than half of the Jewish students across college campuses in the US experience anti-Semitism. Uh, more recently, in a poll uh, done by, conducted by the Brandeis Center again, 2020, shows 65%, 65% of Jewish college students feel unsafe as Jews, and more than 50% hide their Jewish identity. Now think of this. You, I mean, you, you go to school, you're a Jewish kid, you're afraid to say you're Jewish. You're afraid to wear your, wear your mug and dove. You, you're afraid to wear your kippah. Uh, they, they feel unsafe. Um, Tammy Rossman Benjamin, of the Amcha Initiative has done many studies, continues to do really uh, important work on this matter. Uh, she's found that, that uh, faculty members, and not, uh, not, just, it's not just other students, but faculty members as well, buy into this uh, anti-Zionist, anti-Semitism, saying that she, she knows that they advance lies and distortions about Zionism, Israel, and Jews, and advocate for the elimination of the Jewish state. And students, part of what they fear, part of their feeling unsafe is fearing retaliation if they say anything. Of course, students are totally powerless in the hierarchy on the, the academic campus of, you know, professor, senior professors, junior professors, graduate students, undergraduate students, and so on. There is a hierarchy of power. Um, and these aren't just uh, nutcase professors. They're, they're, these, this is a list of some famous ones. Some of them have, have, have passed on. Edward Said is notorious. Uh, Mark Ellis, notorious. Joseph Massad of Columbia. Uh, and th these are major scholars. Uh, around the world, as you can see, they come from various places in the world, uh, US, Canada, Israel, 
uh, Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, a notorious anti-Zionist, wrote the introduction to a book called The Problem of the Gas Chambers by Robert Forisson, which is one of the infamous Holocaust denial text. Chomsky wrote the introduction for that book. Okay. Uh, in the summer of 2020, and you'll notice many of these that uh, in the previous list were, were Jews. Uh, the Jews are not immune to this. Okay. In, in uh, the summer of 2020, when uh, Israel was considering uh, extending the, their civil authority to uh, Jewish settlements, Jewish populated areas in the West Bank, uh, which was referred to as annexation of the West Bank, which is actually not what was happening, more than 400 Jewish scholars, so-called, signed a statement, not just opposing this as a bad idea, bad idea, Israel, bad policy, uh, bad for your security. No, it wasn't just that. It was they, in the statement, they condemned Israel as an apartheid state guilty of crimes against humanity. Note the language, the discourse of intersection. What's the intersection? Israel is same as South Africa. Crimes against humanity, where does that phrase come from? Crimes against humanity was, was what the Nazis were charged with. It was a category of, of, of criminality that was introduced in the war crimes trials post World War II, which was the first time such a such a such trials were ever held. Okay, so same as South Africa, same as Nazis, without saying it, without saying. It. Uh, and these are, I mean, these scholars are well known, and I know, I personally know many of the four hundred who signed off on this. Um, the Algaminer, if you know out this the this uh, institute, the Algaminer Institute uh, lists the the worst campuses, uh, the forty worst campuses each year for anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic activity, threats to Jewish students in 2017. Just to give you an idea, these are were the uh, the ten worst, and you can see these are the good schools. Right when, I, when we're talking about the acceptance of that anti-Semitism in the academy, we're talking about the upper echelons. We're not talking about you know some out of the way place. Uh, so you have it. You have these, this institutional uh, intersectionality uh, where you see anti you know the anti-Semitism primarily in the form of anti-Zionism. Uh, you see it coming from the professors, the academic associations, also comes up from the students, from student groups, uh, among which uh, is, is the uh, Students for Justice in Palestine. Uh, it was founded by uh, Hatem Bazian, um, who, uh, who, was affiliated, who has a tight affiliation with the um, Muslim Brotherhood. He, he renamed the, uh, you know, the Muslim Student Association, uh, Students for Justice in Palestine, to take the, the word Muslim out of it. He thought that uh, that might not, uh, might not work as well, might not go over as well. And so he, you know, he created Students for Justice in Palestine in 2001, um, and this is this is Students for Justice in Palestine. Everything about Israel is illegal. Israel is the same as criminality, uh, same as illegal. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's this is you can see how this is delegitimizing Israel, and what what morally must be done with an illegal entity? What is the moral requirement for dealing with a, a racist entity, uh, an imperialist entity, a colonialist entity, an evil entity? What is the, the moral requirement? 
this is the equation. This is the intersection. It's not just that Zionism is racism. Zionism is Nazism. Jews are same as Nazis. What, what should be done with Nazis? What should be done with uh, the apartheid state? South Africa, it has to be dismantled. If we are to consider ourselves decent human beings, we have to dismantle the Jewish state. Now, Students for Justice in Palestine, who is this outfit? What do they do? What are the, who do with whom do they align themselves? Uh, they, among others, they endorse the Palestinian National and, National and Islamic Forces. It's a, it's a consortium created in 2000 by Yasser Arafat and uh, Marwan Barghouti. It consists of these five uh, officially named terrorist organizations, Hamas, P, the PFLP, uh, the Popular Front, General Command, Palestine Liberation Front, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, okay? Uh, that is, those are the ones with whom they align themselves. They are deeply tied to the BDS movement, Boycott, Divest, Sanction. The aim of the movement created in 2005, there, but the main founder was not the only one, but Omar Barghouti, the aim the ultimate aim is that, as Barghouti has said, the destruction of the Jewish state. Um, Barghouti is, uh, has been uh, a, a, a frequent guest lecturer on college campuses. Um, in uh, 2017, he, or, or 2014, he was hosted at University of California, Riverside by the uh, David Lloyd, distinguished professor of English, uh, and uh, who, uh, where students in eight different classes received extra credit for attending this lecture. During the lecture, he he invoked the what amounts to the blood libel, namely that Israeli soldiers every night go hunting for Palestinian children. Okay, this is the blood libel. And the, the US policy toward Israel is so favorable because Jews control the American government. Uh, world Jewish conspiracy, right? Um, now, what happens in, in the academy never stays in the academy. It, it goes into society in various ways, on various levels, various political, social, and cultural movements. Uh, BDS is a good example. BDS uh, is is a is a is a movement that found not just in you know on university campuses but also through throughout society and in, in legislative bodies and social movements. Uh, BDS is endorsed by Patrice Cullors, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, uh, who who maintains that Palestine is our generation's South Africa, same as Palestine, same as South Africa. If we don't step up boldly and courageously to end the imperialist, imperialist project called Israel, we're doomed. Israel is the same as imperialism. Imperialism is evil. We're doomed, we're morally doomed. If we don't eliminate the imperialist entity Israel, uh, the, the head of Black Lives Matter in Los Angeles, Professor Melina Abdullah, uh, closely uh, affiliated with Nation of Islam, uh, has made the statement that our oppressors, the oppressors of, you know, of, uh, of minority people, people of color, both here and abroad, are the same. And our liberation must be linked, that is to say, the liberation of the of the black lives of the African American and the Palestinians, Jews invade our campus, causing Islamophobia, racism, and intolerance. The Jews are the cause of the problem. It's as it's as is usual with anti-Semitism. The, the premise is not that all Jews are evil, but that all evil is Jewish. Um, with uh, in the case of uh, Yusuf Kogali, Black Lives Matter, uh, you know the head of Black Lives Matter in Toronto, 
she's made this statement that whiteness is not humanness. Whiteness, white skin is subhuman. This, this stems from, not the same as, but is traceable to critical race theory, which is essentialist, right? Race determines essence. This is the essence of whiteness. It's subhuman. White people are recessive genetic defects. It's in the genes, right? It's in the essence. Uh, white supremacy is a mechanism to protect their survival. Okay, white supremacy is something that the white people cannot get rid of. They're, it's like a disease that they carry. Okay. Uh, the moral bond here with uh, Black Lives Matter is, it, 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 with regard to the clergy, is a bond with Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan, who on July 4th, 2020, in a, I think it like a three hour speech, said, addressing the Jews, you are Satan the same as. Um, the social movements, historically civil rights movements, have had a moral grounding and a tie with the clergy. But you'll see in our own time, this is rather different from what it was in the 1960s. Um, this is um, one, of the, one of the several famous photographs of A.J. A. Heschel, Martin Luther King, you see Ralph Abernathy on the right holding Torah scrolls. Um, this is not where the, the current movement finds its moral authority, moral justification. Um, other points of intersection with Black Lives Matter, uh, Muslim American Association, you know, who urges Muslims to align with Black Lives Matter, the, the enemy is the same. The source of the evil is the same, the same as, same as, same as. The, 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 the oppressors of, of Muslims are the oppressors of the African Americans, the same as. And ultimately, it's the Jews. Ultimately, it's the Jews. If you know Linda Sarsour, you know her to be uh, you know, a notorious anti-Zionist uh, with you know, anti-Semitic discourse. Um, she, she sees herself at this intersection. I'm a Muslim and, and I am Black Lives Matter. You, we see this uh, in the same as the identity of the, the evil, the, 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 the Police brutality as an evil in America is the same as the evil of Israeli brutality in Israel. Uh, this, and this is promoted by Black Lives Matter, but not just Black Lives Matter. You, you can see it also in uh, the, uh, the, the deadly exchange movement, uh, which was created by uh, JVP, the Jewish Voices for Peace which claims that the violence in America on the part of the police comes from Israel because it's the Israelis who taught them how to do it. This, uh, this intersection also goes in, not just into social movements, but into political discourse, political figures here and abroad, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, it, you know, it leads him to, to declare in an anti-Zionist stance that Hamas is dedicated to bringing about long-term peace and social justice and political justice. Hamas signifies justice. Israel signifies injustice. Uh, other political and, and academic figures, Angela Davis is, is a political activist and, and an, uh, an academic. She is a vocal advocate for two uh, terrorists. Uh, convicted terrorists, Rasmea Ode and Marwan Barghouti. I don't, I don't know if Marwan is related to Omar, Bar, or Marwan Barghouti is, uh, I think, still in an Israeli prison. Um, we have the squad, this, this, this uh, equation of Israel with racism, uh, this anti-Zionist stance, uh, this support of BDS, finds itself into the Congress and in our representatives in Washington, uh, 
Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Garcia de la Ilan Omar, all of whom, all of whose statements are quite familiar to us. And this goes on, this extends, uh, I'm, I'm sure, to the chagrin of many on the left, but into other quarters, into the jihadists and the fascists. In other words, if I determine that Zionism is evil, that Israel is evil, uh, that Israel is the source of evil, in the name of what do I, can I oppose these examples? Saeed Kut, the, the most influential ideologue of the Muslim Brotherhood, identifies the Jews as the eternal enemy of Islam and the, the evil that plagues humanity, Jews and Israel are the source of racism, colonialism, imperialism, anti-human rights, and so on. Uh, in the name of what do we object to statements like this from Ruhul Khomeini, every Muslim has a duty to prepare himself for battle against Israel. This, is, this could be uh, every person on a college campus. You could hear this voiced by Omar Barghouti or Students for Justice in Palestine, every person has a duty to oppose Israel, to fight against the, the Zionist entity. Uh, where does this go? From the, from the, from the point of view of, uh, of Islamic jihadism, you know, this religious extremism, killing a Jew is, is not only a ne necessary, an unpleasant necessary necessity. It's an act of devotion, something holy and pleasing to God. It makes you moral. It makes you saved, redeemed. It, it, it's it's, it's the, the key to your redemption. In the name of what do, do the other anti-Zionists offer an objection? Uh, it's hatred of the Jews as part of the, the religion. As Os Osama bin Laden asserted, just as it is part of the religion for other sectors, you know, in the, re this, the quote, religion of anti-Zionism. And anti-Zionism does have its religious baggage. Uh, hatred of the Jews is part of the other religions. You see on the right, the religion, in quotes, of the, of the Aryan nations. Uh, and, you know, Richard Butler, founder of the Aryan nations, infamous anti-Semite and anti-Zionist. Uh, these, these important figures in the KKK, Chris Barker, Thomas Roth. These are, there are several different groups of the Ku Klux Klan. These are the two largest, Loyal White Knights and the Knights of the KKK, are the two largest Klan groups. Um, if you go to the internet and, and, uh, and other outlets, you'll find Stormfront, very popular, very widespread, very anti-Zionist. Uh, created by Don Black, in the name of what? If, I, if I'm, you know, coming from the, the academic anti-Zionist left, in the name of what do I oppose Don Black's anti-Zionism? Anti -Zionism, anti -Zionism. Uh, Andrew Anglin, the Daily Stormer, another example. Now the intersections uh, extend back into history and not just in our contemporary time. I'll finish up very quickly here. Uh, Nazi Germany had its, its uh, academic acceptance of anti-Semitism, its intersectionality, you might say. And uh, I can recommend Max Weinreich's book, Hitler's Professors. Hitler's professors, professors. Hitler didn't need the, the, the hoodlums and lunatics. He needed the professors. Uh, one of the most famous, Martin Heidegger, whose influence in academia and academic theory and, and thinking uh, extends into our own time. Uh, Heidegger, who declared in 1933 that the Fuhrer himself and he alone is the present and future German reality and its law. Walter Schulze of the uh, Nazi University lecturers declared uh, you know that the that the what the great thinkers of, of the German intellectual tradition dreamed of came to comes to pass with national socialism the fact the phenomenon 
of a doctor's trial among the war, war crimes trial, to me is mind blowing. It's a doctor's trial and a judge's trial. A judge's trial. This is how the acceptance of anti-Semitism in the academy plays out. So I, to me, as, as an academic myself, I want to say to my fellow academics, I want to remind you of a scene from Judgment at Nuremberg, and I'll end with this. There's a scene in which, uh, this is based on the judge's trial. Uh, the, the defense attorney is really haranguing a witness, uh, browbeating a witness who is testifying, a, a non-Jewish woman testifying to uh, you know, a, an ac accusation against a Jew who made so-called improper advances to her and so on. And the defense attorney is browbeating her until finally Ernst Yanning, one of the defendants, stands up played by Burt Lancaster, and shouts at the attorney, are we going to do this again? And so I, I want to say to my fellow professors, scholars, and academics here, are we going to do this again? Are we going to do this again? Thanks so much. So Spetson, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, we've got a few questions uh, here in the in the in the chat, but people feel free, to, please, people um, feel free to to um, put a few more in. Um, so we've got one question from uh, Christine, um, who asks, "Where do Jews who support anti-Zionism and BDS fit into intersectionality?" Oh, well, it's intersectionality exploits. Uh, actually, our, our, our finest inclinations are the inclination to be good, to be regarded as good. Uh, I, I think what draws many Jews into this is the, the desire to be viewed as a good Jew. If those Jews, those Zionist Jews are bad, I am an anti-Zionist Jew, or I can be very critical of Zion, of Israel, the Jewish state. Look at me. Um, but you can be critical of the Jewish state in all kinds of ways, legitimate ways, without denouncing the state as apartheid state or guilty of crimes against humanity. Um, but this, there is a redemptive desire here, a, a redemptive aspect of this phenomenon of intersectionality. It promotes uh, redemption. It promotes moral purity. It promotes justice. It's, it's we are for justice. We are just. We are the good guys. So and it exploits that, hum, that human inclination to be good, especially in the young. Uh, on college campuses, the young are beautiful and amazing in their idealism. But it, it's often nefariously used against them here and exploited. I think that's what's going on. Oh, sorry, I was on mute there. So I better put him with the mute there. Thank you so much. We've got another question as well um, that says, how do we stop the hijacking of the left um, who, who continue to openly and allow and support those who judge the Jewish state by a double standard that they hold to no other state? Um, well, once, one thing we can do is to call them out, uh, is to expose them, is to expose the double standard, is to expose the double talk. Uh, but this would this would require a lot of courage because uh, it's, it isn't fashionable to oppose this discourse of justice. I mean, the word justice has been appropriated in, in many cases and, and abused here. Um, we, we can oppose them by by naming it, by naming the evil, by saying that, that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism it is hatred not just of the Jew, but of the other human being, as Levinas says. Uh, 
anti anti Zionism legitimizes murder. Anti Zionism legitimizes terrorism. Right? It legitimizes hostage taking. Uh, so that the if if we can expose the complicity in violence, acts of violence that that is uh, that are engendered by the left, we can do that. We can also raise the question, as I raised near the end, when we're dealing with the the far right, the white supremacists, or or when we're dealing with Islamic jihadists, we see that evil, right? But we have, we have to ask, what is, what is there on the left? In the name of what on the left can we oppose it? At least in the name of what can we oppose jihadist anti-Zionism or white supremacist anti-Zionism? In the name of what? There's nothing. Uh, so we have to uh, continue to raise the question, pose the challenge, and call, call them out. And you know, through things like what we what ISGAP does, through uh, you know, speaking engagements on campus, uh, through we need to uh, educate certainly Jewish students, but not just Jewish students on campus on how to respond to this. Fantastic! Thank you very much. Got an another question now. It says. Um, regarding a recurring point in the presentation, is there a secular basis for opposing these current trends of manifestation of anti-Semitism? If so, what is it beyond simply asserting that it's wrong? Um, is there a secular basis? The, I mean, the secular basis is, is uh, I would say, more difficult. Why? Because the the... The, the most fundamental opposition to, to what we see going on with anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, uh, the most fundamental opposition lies in an opposition between two views of what determines the sanctity of a human being. Uh, the, the, we have to you know, be able to oppose, in the case of critical race theory, which influences much of this, the idea that race is a determining principle in understanding the sanctity or the meaning, the value of a human being. Uh, we have to oppose the category of race as such. This is uh, from a, from a Judeo-Christian, uh, certain, a certain religious tradition, this is, this is more easily done, at least in principle, by appealing to the creator uh, image and likeness of the Holy One, the bond of each human being to the other physically and metaphysically and so on. It's much more easily done in a religious context than in a secular context. Um, the, I mean, the secular value historically, in many cases, ultimately re re has to resort to power, to a power struggle. Uh, an ideological struggle um, because there's no ultimately if, with, without God if by secular you mean without God there's no limiting principle right so I mean, it, it can it, one can um, from a secular point of view oppose it just in the name of truth integrity, and honesty um, so yeah, you can do it, but it's you. I think the the secular ground is shakier than the religious ground when it comes to opposing this form of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. I mean, Zion, after all, is a religious term. It comes from the Bible, from the scriptures. Fantastic! Thanks so much. We've got <clears throat> one last question here from Daniel which says a really fascinating and valuable talk, but don't follow the argument about Judaism itself being inherently antithetical to the idea of race. Isn't Judaism an ancient religion, whereas the idea of race is relatively new? And isn't Judaism a particularist rather than a universalist religion, e.g. the idea of the chosen people? Uh, yeah, this is an excellent question. Uh, race is a modern concept, at least as, as the term is used now. 
And in biblical Hebrew, there's no equivalent to the term race that we use as we use it now. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the rabbis teach us that uh, God begins with one human and not two, so that no one can say to another, my side of the family is better than your side. There's only one side of the family, and we are family. Uh, the Hebrew word for human being is ben Adam, a child of Adam. So we have this fundamental connection. Race, as it's used now, is about a fundamental disconnection, a fundamental disconnection. So uh, the, the universalism of Judaism, universalism in particularism, is always a, a, you know, a, a tension in Judaism uh, as the chosen people. But what are the ch chosen people chosen for? Chosen means assigned. It doesn't mean privileged or elite. Chosen means God is saying to the Jews, I'm asking you, I'm assigning you the task, the dangerous task of bearing witness to the truth that every human being is chosen for a responsibility that no other human can, can meet, can fulfill. Uh, something of infinite value is placed into the hands of every human being. Uh, and there's an infinite responsibility to and for the other human being that devolves upon each of us. So the Jew is chosen to wake the rest of us from our sleep, from our complacency, uh, from our illusion that our that, that our salvation is settled it's not settled we there's always more to be more to do we always have to ask the question answer the question that god asks us where is your brother and what have you done the questions he put to cain so the jew in his in his or her chosenness particularity is here to say to universal humanity god is asking us you know where are you where is your brother what have you done and most of us don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it. Um, Israel as a state signifies that, that being singled out uh, from above and from below. So uh, you, you, you see how this, this undermines the, the, the separation of races uh, the, and, and race theory, uh, how this, this, this teaching that and this is extraordinary this is extraordinary this teaching that that every soul that comes into this world that comes into creation is indispensable to all of creation that's what the jews are asked to say to the world uh, and what in many cases historically as you see many of us in the world don't want to hear it Thanks so much, Professor. I think that's a wonderful um, moment to end this presentation on. So thank you so much for speaking and thank you very much for coming to this talk today. And uh, we hope to see you all at the next uh, installments of the uh, seminar series. Thank, thank you. you so